Hi, this is Bruce McConnell with Locomotive Systems Training. Welcome back to our uh, series of FRA Locomotive Inspections, part one that we're working on. And like I mentioned, eventually we'll get to a part two, which is going to be air brakes. Uh, this is LSTV-018. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we're doing here. Swing hanger bushings. Ah, <clears throat> we talked about the swing hanger earlier. We talked about the upper and lower bearing blocks. We talked about the spring plank. Uh, so now we'll go up to the upper end of this assembly and take a look at that. So as you're the swing hanger bushings, the purpose of the swing hanger bushing is to provide the swing hanger pin a pivot point which enables the swing hanger to move. The swing hanger bushing is a renewable wear surface between the truck frame and the swing hanger pin. Note, the truck frame bushings usually do not wear because the swing hanger pin does not rotate. What rotates is the swing hanger bushing. The swing hanger bushing will indicate where at the bottom of the bushing see the specification below. Now that doesn't mean to say that one could not ever move but in almost 40 years of railroading that I've been involved in I have never seen a worn uh, swing hanger pivot pin bushing. So but let's take a look at it. So we now know that uh, the swing hanger which literally the one on the left and right side literally support half the weight of that locomotive is a rather substantial piece of metal. It has to be holding up a lot a lot of weight. Okay. So when the truck again goes around, or the locomotive goes around a curve, there's a kind of a pendulum action that occurs in the swing hanger assembly. The spring plane moves laterally, left and right, side to side, as the locomotive negotiates the turn or the curve. Okay? So we have a limited pivoting action in here. So <clears throat> what usually moves, and then like I said earlier, is the swing hanger itself. The swing hanger bushings are the ones that normally wear. So those are the ones you want to look. You want to look at all, everything to make sure there's no defects anywhere. I always look to make sure that the step out over here. Make sure the pin is good. Make sure the bushing here is not worn past the limit, as well as the cast iron member of the of the the uh, truck frame. Everything. All right. Um, the rules. Number one: cracked or chunked out bushing. I've seen that happen on the swing hanger. Uh, again, it could, be, it could be referred to as a result of a, of a physical damage due to a derailment or a side swipe. You always want to look for that. Uh, but the ones that the, the big thing that we look for here is the top bushing to pin clearance exceeding an eighth of an inch. <clears throat> and again, note this is not an FRA uh, specification; it's a manufacturer specification. So if I look in here between this open area here and here. And if I see a clearance of an eighth of an inch or more between the bottom of that bushing and that pin, then I would write that up as a defect. Again, FRA-wise, I don't think they, they consider that a defect. But I know that on, on the manufacturer specification, anything greater than an eighth of an inch wear between the pin and the bushing, they consider that excessive wear and time for change. Okay? Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Pedestal tie bar. <clears throat> That's this area right here. It's a rather large substantial chunk of iron that's there and let's find out what the purpose of it is. The purpose of the pedestal tie bar is to keep the truck pedestal jaws in parallel. The pedestal tie bar also prevents the journal box from coming out of the truck pedestal jaws in the event of a derailment which we mentioned on the last video. Remember I said there's retainment <clears throat> what they call an anti slewing device that connects the truck frame to the locomotive frame while this big and it's about one inch thick that's about a six to eight inch wide piece of metal that grows from this side of the bottom of the pedestal jaw all the way over and 90 degrees up to this side of the bottom of that pedestal jaw. And what it does is designed to keep the pedestal jaw parallel and it also keeps the pedestal jaws from flexing and it also retains the traction motor in the event of derailment. That journal box would slide down, hit there, and that locomotive traction motor would be intact and would be held in place. Okay? All right, the rules. Uh, DVAC loose or missing fasteners, and there's two big bolts down there and washers and whatnot that I use to hold together. Bent damage or missing pedestal tie bar. Note, the pedestal tie bar is also referred to as a binder. That's slang term for what they call it in the railroad industry. I got a loose binder bolt, or I got a loose binder, okay? But the proper name for it is a pedestal tie bar. It ties the whole uh, assembly together, okay? Let's go to the next one. Journal box coil springs. The purpose of the journal box coil springs is to absorb road bed oscillations, the up and down movement of the journal box. These guys, these springs take a pounding. If you ever go drive alongside a, 
uh, a, a main line in the railroad track and you watch those springs, those journal boxes, they're going up and down constantly. So they take a constant pounding and make sure you keep the eye on the road. Don't look at that and say, well, Bruce said it was okay. No, 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 no. Keep your eye on the road. If you're a passenger, that's okay to look, but not while you're driving the vehicle. <clears throat> a safety point. Again, the purpose, uh, purpose of the journal box is to absorb roadbed oscillations. A uh, lot of things to look for right here. Let's come on up a little bit. It says there are women. Hold on. It says there are broken coil springs. That's usually one of the big problems with these. Now, these coil springs sit in a nest up inside the truck frame. Not exactly the most easiest thing to look at when this whole thing is surrounded by a structure of metal on both sides. But there are ways you can, can angle your light up there to see both front and behind. Uh, if they're cracked, or broken, you can generally, as a rule, see them. So broken coil springs, weak coil spring. The, if you have a weak one, the journal box, instead of it sitting parallel like this one is, the journal box will actually go, be cocked to one side or the other. That's a pretty good indication, either extreme wear of the journal box, or you might have a broken or a weak spring. Always look for that. Uh, bent, cracked, or broken coil spring saddle. That's this guy right here. It's got the ears, or three ears. Those actually hold the coil springs up, up the top of the spring, coil spring, and at the bottom they hold them from wobbling out of place, so they retain those. Sometimes these get bent out of shape, sometimes they'll get cracked, and sometimes those ears will actually fracture off. That becomes a federal defect. Um, load bearing block out of place on top of the journal box, that's this guy right here. And what will happen is, that, that is a result of when they raise the traction motor up and they put that traction motor in place, they don't load that properly and that loading block will either sit this way or this way. And if it does that, you'll see an abnormal amount of wear either on the outside edge of the pedal liner or a severe amount of wear on the inside of the pedal liner. That there is a seating area for that and that has to sit in there straight level, okay? Um, says here number five, what are the components in the yellow circles and what is their function? Well, if you remember from the last last slide, I showed you that these are what they call stink bombs. I don't know if that's the official word for it. Um, I don't even, I haven't, I've never looked that up what those were. But anyway, again, if you're, uh, if you have privy information on that, give me a call or send me an email and let me know what the proper name of those are. I'm guessing maybe some short lines may still use them. I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of these railroads have gone to uh, hot box detectors, which would make these null and void. So, um, but if you have information, send it to me and let me know. I'll give you the web address at the end of this uh, videotape here. But anyway, when the journal box gets heated up from a hot running bearing, low oil, whatever, then the center would melt out. And when that center would melt out, remember I was telling you from the previous one, had a very high sulfurous, like a rotten egg smell. And believe you me, if you're in a caboose and that train's going down the track, you're going to smell that thing. And, and that would crew, uh, alert the... Uh, operating crew in the back of that caboose that we got a hot, a hot axle or a hot running bearing, stop the train, we got to find out what it is and pull over and take care of it. That's what those were for back in the old days. And again, this shot over here shows a little bit better shot. You got some openings here. We can actually look in there and see these coil springs. So there are little areas that you can look at for these cracked or, or weakened springs. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Pedestal liner. Here we have the pedestal liners in this yellow area right here. Some are made out of steel. Some are made out of what they call a, uh, it's kind of a, like a plastic, uh, really hard plastic called phenolic. Okay. And what it does is a pedestal liner. Well, let's just take, read it and take a look and then we'll come back to it. The purpose of the pedestal liner is to provide a contact service for the journal box assembly to move vertically in. The pedestal liner is a renewable wear surface. Note, there's no federal limit, wear limit, or spe wear specification between the pedestal liner and the journal box wear plate. Most railroads limit the wear to either 3 8 or half inch total before a pedestal liner change out. And I've seen that, that dimensions uh, floating around most of the railroads. So, um, but again, I've never seen that as a federal requirement, a, a federal wear limit for pedestal liners. Okay? Uh, some are made out of steel, like I said. Some are made out of phenolic. Some are either bolted. Some are either riveted. Some are even hucked into place, what they call a huck bolt. H-U-C-K, huck bolt. Okay? Uh, they'll crack, they'll peel away, especially on the, on the phenolic ones. Uh, they'll drop down the, if the, the bolts shear or if the phenolic plate cracks, it'll drop, drop the pedestal liner down onto the binder. So let's go back and take a look. Defects, looser missing fasteners, which we just mentioned. 
cracked, chunked out, or broken, or missing parts of the pedestal liner, worn out, just severely worn past that 3 8 or half inch wear limit, <clears throat> whichever railroad that you work for, or whichever railroad you're working on, would uh, prescribe, and severe journal box lug wear on the pedestal liner, either inside or outside. Remember, if this thing wears through there, and now you're into the cast area of the pedestal itself, these ears can actually wear into there. I've seen that happen. And that's pretty severe when it gets to that point. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, well, I, I'll, already we're at the end of our video. Again, I want to encourage you to go back, view the video, and go to our, the, not our website, but the federal government, the FRA's website of www.fra.dot.gov. And if you get a chance, you have information or questions uh, on our videos, please refer back to lst-ca.com. Once again, that's lst-ca.com. LST and give us a call, send us an email, and let's talk. Thank you and have a safe day.